It's great to see you guys. It's always good to be here, and especially at this time of year. I don't know why it's always so exciting, but it is. It's just one of those great times when you feel good about things, and nothing's going to get that down. And so I made it here. I'm not sure why. Mike's already done the scripture. I already took all the scriptures and already told the story. We've already sung the story. And, you know, I had presents to show you that we're going to be talking about a child for all. And here's some of the presents. But Jeff already announced all the presents. (laughs) And so, I mean, there's a ton of them back there. It's really impressive what you guys have done. And so it's amazing to see all of that. So you would think I would be done but I'm not. (laughs) No, not quite. Because we want to talk about this idea of a child that comes and a child that is here. Uh, We've already looked at some of this. We already know about the story. It's one of the longest stories that you see in Scripture. If you think about it, from the time the child is is talked about and then born and then goes to Simeon and Anna in the first week. And you've got chapters of the Bible taken up. And how many stories does it have chapters of the Bible to describe like a week? We, we just don't see that very often. And so that just tells me one thing. It must be really, really important that God would take that much time and send that much inspiration to his people to write down that much detail about exactly what's going on with Jesus. And so I think this must be something. He is a child for all of us. It begins long ago where he is the promised child to Abraham. He's a blessing for all nations. He's going to be a leader for all, and he's also a child for all. Normally, we have a child in a family, and it's that family's child. Uh, Even if we like that child and we try and take the child away, they're going to come get it. And so, as you think about that and think about what happens, that child belongs to that one family. And... He might have uncles or grandparents, right? Grandparents are most important. And, you know, cousins and all these other people. Mom and dad, of course. It's not just our child. But Jesus is our child. For everyone. For everyone in the whole world. How do you get the whole world to celebrate the birth of your child? Well, uh, I think only God can do that. So we look at Isaiah chapter 9. He's going to prophesy a long time before about the birth of the child. The actual passage deals a lot with Assyria's coming, and they're very threatened by this. They're afraid of Assyria, and they're afraid of the condition they're going to be in. And so it seems odd to... God would put this in this place and that Isaiah would be given this message. But that's exactly what happens here. As we look at the passage and what he does, he talks about this child is to be born. And yeah, they're dealing with times of war, and so he puts that in here as well. But he talks about this time of darkness, this time about when they were in this time of darkness and they saw a great light. That there is going to be hope, that there is going to be something good that's going to be happening. That people have seen this great light and this great light has shone for a dark world. And certainly that's what you have without God and without His creation is you've got just a dark world and nothing else. But the light has shone and there's joy found in blessings. There's battles that have been done, that have been fought and that have been won. And then he goes to, there's a child that has been born, a son that has been given. Doesn't that seem a little strange? We always want the conquering hero, the one who's able to either buy everything, pay for everything, or be big enough to be able to win everything. 
He says, I'm going to put it all in a child, and I want you to understand what I'm trying to say about the child. He says, the government's going to be on his shoulders. What if the child was elected president? Would you be comfortable there? Well, why would he say a child? The government is on his shoulders. That, wow. Wow. I think he's trying to get at the innocence of a child, the simplicity of a child, and that we worry about so many things back and forth about the government this way, the government that way, what's going to happen, and he says, why don't you put it on Jesus? Because he's the one who governs over us. He is the one who is our king. He is the one who's most important. And then he says, let me tell you the names that are going to be there for this child. What an amazing thing. He, said, he calls him Wonderful Counselor. The counselor is someone who comes alongside to help. He's there to be able to explain things. It's not like our counselors today where you would have them reflect back. You know, how do you feel? Well, I feel terrible. Why do you think you feel terrible? You know, and you get all of this back and forth about, well, let me help you to solve your own problem by reflecting back what you tell me. Uh, that's not Jesus. Back in this time, the counselor was the one they would bring in that would say, yes, I think you can win the battle. The counselor would be the one who says, this is where we are, this is where we start, and this is the best advice I can give you. And so it would be that type of counselor on strategies or battles. He calls him mighty God, and certainly that's what we can see in God from the very beginning, even with creation. We see it as he deals with families. We see it as he brings David. We see it as he brings a flood. We see it as he brings all kinds of things that happen. There are battles that are fought. There are places that are won. Even as we look at some of the the amazing things God has done. But this is Jesus, right? Jesus is a mighty God. And so we can see Jesus as he comes to this earth. He certainly is a mighty God and able to heal every disease and everything that goes wrong and able to forgive sin. And then it calls him everlasting Father. Well, we normally think of God as being the Father. You know, we've assigned specific roles to them. God is the Father, even though they're all God, right? But then Jesus is the Son because the Son is born on earth, and therefore He's the Son because He's born. And we kind of think maybe He's less than God because, after all, the Father's always more important than the Son, right? But He's trying to tell you just the opposite, we're going to call him eternal father. Not just father, eternal father. Well, but we've always thought of God as being father. I mean, from Abraham's time, you're going to have a son. And so God's kind of the father of Abraham and God's the father of people all along. It refers to the children of Israel as from God their father, right? But you've also got to realize that we're born again through Jesus. That's how birth happens. It's into what Jesus brings. It's into the blood of the cross. And that's what he brings. And so we would call him eternal father because we have been born of water and the spirit. And he's the one who makes family as we are baptized into the blood of Christ and that is applied to us. And then he's also called Prince of Peace, where he makes peace possible. We're always the ones who want to fight and quarrel and, and try to get our way and try to get an advantage. And he's the Prince of Peace. He's the one who's able to bring about peace. And that's what he does. He comes to bring peace among people. But he does it by bringing a cross and then he says the increase of his government and peace will be unending. Wow. That's an amazing prophecy. And if you were hearing it in times of trouble, 
you are hearing it in times of trouble. And I want you to realize that prophecy is for us today, that that's where it is fulfilled. And he says, the zeal of the Lord will do this. When God is zealous about it, when just God has to just want to, and it's going to happen. What an amazing thing it is to realize as they talk about this Messiah from way back. And I'm so glad we're on this side of it where we can see and understand exactly how it happened through the story and how the child is going to be born. Another passage in Isaiah is found in Isaiah chapter 7. Let me read the passage and then we'll talk about why it's there. He says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, and he shall eat curds and honey. And when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, for therefore the boy, for before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. Well, if you back up to the beginning of the chapter, and I know you don't have your Bible open, you're just watching the screen up here, right? So get your Bible open or else just listen to this story. He's talking about Ahaz, who is king of Judah. And as you think about Ahaz, who's king of Judah, he's got two kings who are coming against him. One is Rezin, the king of Syria. The other is Pekah, the king of Israel. And Judah's a fairly small little country, and it doesn't have many resources, and it's kind of afraid of all of this. And so what are they going to do? How are they going to accomplish this? And this is the prophecy of God to his people to help them to understand what it is that they can do in the, in, the, in the face of all of this danger is they're looking at two kings who are camped outside their walls or who are there specifically to destroy them. And he said, the Lord's going to give you a sign. All right, that's good. I want, you know, fire from heaven, something that's going to take care of these enemies that we've got. He says, a virgin's going to conceive and bear a son. And you're going to call him Emmanuel. You're going to call him God with you. Not exactly the sign we were looking for. Uh, We were thinking maybe of a better sign, a little bit more powerful of a sign. And he says he's not going to have any problem in his time. There's going to be no famine By the time he refuses evil and chooses good and knows how to refuse evil and choose good, you're not, those kings aren't even going to exist. It's not even going to be there. And all the things that you worry about now are things that do not exist in that time. And so I'm going to point you to a time that you can know about God, a time that you can depend on God, a time that you can know this is what's important, this is what's secure. And that time is about Jesus. And even some of the details about Jesus, the fact that a virgin would bear a son, really? Yeah, God, you're going to accomplish that. And so you can see all the detail that goes into this as we look at how God tells his own story as he talks about this idea of Emmanuel and God being with us, as God being on earth. And God uses that for a sign that this is going to be true. And we know that armies will come and go. We know that power will come and go. And we've taken enough world history to where we understand that the same people that used to be in charge long ago are not in charge anymore. And it would be nice to think that we'll go on forever. But there's only one person who goes on forever, and that's the Son. That's Jesus Christ. And so put every single problem in face of Jesus Christ. It's how big the picture is. If you've got a flat tire on the way here, and you're focused like this on that tire, then that's all you can see is there's a flat tire. What am I going to do with a flat tire? How am I ever going to fix this? Well, you just call the AAA or you get the jack out or what. I mean, but if you focus on that, that's all you can see. We need to see the bigger picture. 
there's, there's a tire there, just put it on. You've had flats before. It's, it's not a problem. It's going to get fixed. It only takes an hour. It's, it's fairly easy to do. But sometimes we get our life so focused on the fact that this is what our problem is. And God seems to focus on so, so much more that when he gives us a sign, we don't understand it because it's not as meaningful to us. And so focus your life and plan your life on him. It's more important than pika or reason, either one. He's more important than the coronavirus and anything else that might threaten us. Anything else that might be around us that isn't going right and is threatening your day. We know the story. Because we know how it works out. And so why does Jesus come as a child? It's one of those mysteries. I think we're meant to wonder about it. And yet I think really why he comes is to show us that in the middle of the tragedy, whatever tragedy you're having, if you look at Jesus' time, the unwed mother and unwed father, that a baby would come, the threats from Herod, the wise men, the shepherds, they're all coming to watch and to worship that a child could be born, that God could be born, Emmanuel, God with us, so fragile. And what we see is so fragile that God would place it in the middle of our tragedy and feel perfectly confident that it is safe and that it will work and have no worry about it whatsoever, even in spite of the flight that goes to Egypt and the fake IDs and the forged passports and trying to get across the border as you smuggle a child that they're looking for and hunting for out of the country into a different country until you can wait for a, for a king to die. And yeah, children need to be taken care of. Do we need to be afraid of that? We probably need to pray. But it seems as if God's been doing this for a long time, giving children to people with no experience whatsoever. I mean, they don't know how to do this. They have no clue what they're doing. And yet somehow all of us survived. And we all grew up and we all did the same thing to our children. And God says, that's the way I've planned it all. So how do you get the world to celebrate a birth? We realize children are everywhere. We have friends with children, relatives with children, or we babysit children. You can't get away from children. They're going to be running around after church. They're going to be up here on this stage. I don't know why they're so attracted to this, but for some reason, running up here is better than running anywhere else. And so, but we can't get away from children. Not that we would want to. Just want you to know it's one of God's biggest illustrations he ever uses is to talk about this child that he placed in the middle of all the tragedy that's going on, in the middle of all the threats. There's a story I want to tell you that happened a few, two years ago, 2018. I took this picture. It looked so peaceful. I looked out and I was like, that... In any other circumstance, that would be such a peaceful setting. What a great thing to look at that and go, that's almost the postcard, right? Other than it's just a street. It's got the snow. It's not Arizona, by the way. <laughs> you need to know the background to the picture a little bit because I think all of us are like this. 
I had to pull it off my Facebook. It's dated December 16th of 2018. And what had happened is there had been an earthquake up in Alaska where my sister lives. The place where she lives is in an apartment building or a condo building, so she owns the one on the bottom floor, but the one on the top floor, they were all fine. They weren't broken apart or anything like that, so it could have been worse. But the water heater had fallen over in the top one, and no one lived there. And it ran and poured water and poured water and poured water because it busted the pipes until she's about this deep in water. And you jump out of bed in the morning and, okay, wait, this is not going to be good. And so everything had to be taken out. She had some friends that helped her haul away the big stuff so that they could at least get the carpet out of there because you have to get all the carpet out of there. And by then it soaked up the walls a little while and so everything had to be taken away. Black mold is starting. Things had to be cleaned up. So I flew up there to help my sister. And so we were working about 12-hour days trying to get new things, trying to clean up all the old things. And man, she had a mess. Don't tell her I said that, okay? (laughs) But it's a mess. There's stuff everywhere. It'd be like your house, you know, in the middle of December. And there's just stuff all over the place. And then you've got people coming in and just hauling out this wet, nasty, dirty carpet. Because by the time it's been in there a few years, anytime you get it wet, it's going to be wet, nasty, dirty carpet. And so you bring it out. We've got to buy new stuff, a new cabinet. They cut the walls to about this high and have to rip the sheetrock off the bottom because of the black mold that's starting. And so you've got all of this stuff going on. And there's a lot of stuff that needs to be fixed, a lot of stuff that had been left undone. And... I think it was about 7, 7.30 one morning. Some of you know Jerry Jones, Jerry and Marilyn that come here. They're, Ma, Jerry's mom used to live here. He's now got two grandkids who are back up in Alaska, but who are in college and living here. And he happens to live in Anchorage, and I've known him since I was this tall. And... Uh, long time. And so we're there and he happens to be there so I can fly up. I can stay with Jerry and I can stay with Marilyn. And of course, well, he's got a truck, so we need a truck to be able to haul stuff with. And early one morning, we're pulling out of his house and it had snowed. And that's the picture. In the middle of all the disaster. In the middle of the flood, in the middle of all the reconstruction, the snow makes everything look peaceful. It's perfect weather in the 20s. Not going to melt. That's why it needs to be in the 20s. At least it's not below zero. And it looks so peaceful. And that's what we need to focus on. Is God's able to bring this kind of peace to our world? But you've got to notice it. Because if you're just focused on the flood or the black mold or the sheetrock that's ripped out or all the stuff that you've got to buy or the furnace that you've got to fix or all the other stuff that's going out, you're never going to see the picture. And that's what Isaiah says. I'm going to send a child the most fragile thing you can imagine. And I'm going to put him in the middle of all of your problems. And he's going to be perfectly safe as people threaten his life. Because he's God. 
And God can do anything He wants to. I've asked Mike to sing a song for us as we close this. It's one of my favorite ones, and I think maybe illustrates Isaiah the best. It's called Silent Night. We don't know where this one is. It's just another snow picture. But doesn't that look peaceful? And your life can look that way too with Jesus. It can be a silent night, a holy night. And the song talks about gathering around the virgin with mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace. For unto us a child is born. As the soldiers move and as people have to move places and the threats come, sleep in heavenly peace. Silent night, holy night. Shepherds quake at the sight, glories stream from heaven above, heavenly hosts sing hallelujah. He is our Savior from sin, from cruelty, from ugliness, from whatever we do to each other, from hate. Christ, a Savior, is born. And that Savior is born into our silent night. And He saves us from evil. And He saves us from ourselves. The third verse is silent night, holy night. Son of God, love's pure light. Radiant beams from Thy holy face with the dawn of redeeming grace. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. And still a silent night. In the middle of all the chaos, in the middle of all the trouble, in the middle of all the soldiers and the sickness and the death, and the pride and the arrogance, a child is born, a Savior is born, a Lord is born. Is there any worry we have that could compete with the coming of Jesus? And how confident God is at placing a child in the middle of all the turmoil. Knowing he will be safe, knowing he is holy, knowing he is Savior. And it's a silent night. It's time to let God bring some silence into your life. His blessings are amazing. He isn't worried or bothered about a virus. And within a few years, it's not going to be a problem. It'll all be solved. But one thing is more important. Jesus Christ will have been in your life this year. And He has a reason with God being born on earth that is worth celebrating. So today, if your life isn't right with Christ, you need to make it that way. This is the time. What are you waiting for? So that tonight can be a silent night. Because there is a Savior. Let's stand and sing.